Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's been a little bit of a routine for us to get on Facebook Live on Thursday. And I hope that um, all of you are as well as you can be, that you're safe and healthy and uh, your dog is looking after you well. I have um, my team member, Alicia, here, uh, who is going to be helping me. Hi, Alicia. Hi, everyone. <laughs> and we'll be also having Christina behind the scenes providing us links and information that I'll be talking about. Um, this morning has been a little busy. Um, I always try to be on time, but with uh, technology and Facebook and everything that goes on, it's, it's always hard. There's always a little bit of a challenge uh, with either audio or uh, internet or something like that. So today I, I prepared a um, um, simple, I'm just gonna say presentation or a little chat about why disease happens. And I also prepared a few slides for you. Um, I'm not gonna go slide heavy because I know that it gets boring, but I would like to talk to you a little bit about why disease happens and uh, what you can do about it. And, and generally, the reason why I'm doing these live broadcasts is that I would like you to little um, simple way, healing in a little simple way. Because if you see it um, not as complicated, if it doesn't seem as complicated, then you'll be able to address some of these conditions in very simple ways. It's almost like you learn the operating system of healing. You learn the operating system of medicine. And I know that, um, that you still will need your veterinarian and you will need surgical skills um, of the veterinarian or blood test or examination. I'm not necessarily ex expecting you to know that, but what I would like you to do is to feel empowered and be able to make decisions and mainly prevent disease. Tomorrow is going to be Pax's first birthday, uh, which is really fun. We're gonna have a few different posts and I'll be making a cake for him. And we will have a social distancing visit in the garden here with two other doggies that we usually go on walks with. So it's gonna be fun. And I just uh, decided I'm going to make a heart cake tomorrow uh, from chicken hearts and some healthy ingredients. So keep in touch. I will be sharing screen today on and off, um, mainly because um, I would like you to have the visual and just kind of, um, um, Think of, uh, think of um, what I'm going to be sharing with you in very simple ways. And, uh, you know, uh, pictures are always uh, uh, the, the most uh, effective and powerful. Um, so let me just share my screen here. I will do that. And then I'm going to um, turn on the presentation here. And Alicia, you will let me know if you're seeing the, uh, if you're seeing um, the slides or not. Can you yes, see they, them? Yes, I can. They've just come up. Thanks for checking. Perfect, perfect. Um, so today is part two of what I call the healing cycle. Uh, last time I was explaining that the most important part in maintaining health is actually to provide the right nutrients and feed your dog right and detox and align the spine and then also allow the body to repair the DNA. Today, I'll be talking about toxins and heavy metals and what you can do about them. People usually want to know what uh, happens, why, why, why disease happens. If I diagnose a dog with a certain condition, the first question that I get is why? Why does it happen? Why did it happen to my dog? And why is it happening? And I want to know now. And Quite often, I get the impression that people feel that there's one or two causes of a disease, and if they address them, that it's going to be all fine. And it is not necessarily that way. You know, disease is more like this. When I, when I have a patient coming to my practice and I get all the information, I feel like I've entered a really messy room. 
because there are so many different factors. Like if you try to find the cause of this messiness, or if you try to find a little, little um, memory chip, memory uh, disc with some photography from 2005, it's gonna be very difficult, right? And you will, you will wanna, number one, you will wanna see why is it so messy? And number two, how can I find the solution and where can I find the key? Finding a key in this mess is usually really, really difficult. And so what you need to do is to kind of start gradually organizing and knowing and learning how to actually start organizing and also understanding that disease is actually multifactorial, meaning that there is not just one thing that happens, but a chain of events that happens. And then there are those people who say, well, you know, it's the genetics. Uh, I see that a lot with, uh, with um, cancer patients or people who get cancer. Uh, they say, well, you know, I'm genetically predisposed. I can't do anything about it. But it is not exactly true, because as I said, disease is multifactorial and many, many um, uh, elements play a role. In fact, genetics are actually very kind of like minor amount of, of why it happens, because genes, believe it or not, they have a turn on, turn off switch. If you have a if you have a gene for predisposition to lung cancer, the on switch was, is going to be uh, polluted, polluted air, smoking, um, stress, poor nutrition, history of thoracic back problems, which also compromises the lungs. And those are the turn on switches. And you are actually able to turn some of these switches off, toxins as well, right? Toxins from the cigarettes, the, all the, all the uh, chemicals that are in cigarettes and, and uh, smoke. So this is just to give you an idea that um, cancer, for example, happens as a result of genetic predisposition. But most genetists say that the genetic, pre genetic predisposition plays about 20% role in the overall predisposition, that the rest is epigenetics or on the outside, of the genes or on the end of the of the DNA and chromosome, right? So you can, you know, you can go further into exploring and researching epigenetics. What I wanted you to know is that you actually can feel quite empowered in preventing your dog's disease and your own disease. But at the same time, when it happens and you do your best, you should not be blaming yourself because beside people asking the question why, they all also ask like, is it my fault? And I would say that there are some situations where we know what we should be doing and then we still don't do it because of bad habits or difficult life situation. Those situations, I guess, are at question. If I know that I shouldn't be smoking and I smoke and then I get cancer and I ask, uh, is it my fault? I'd say, you know, you know whether it is or not, at least partially, you probably increase the chances of that. Or if we feed our dogs kibble and, uh, you know, and feed recipes that first ingredients is corn and starch and uh, pork fat and, you know, chicken byproducts, uh, we probably know that we are not feeding our dogs the best. So again, is it our fault that our dogs get cancer? I'd say we shouldn't blame ourselves if we don't know what we don't know. But I do think that we should take responsibility in the situations where we actually know what we are doing wrong and we just decide not to. And even then, we should have compassion with ourselves because habits, uh, stress, um, lifestyle, whatever it is actually affects us and our decisions. You know, they say that you could find something positive in everyone. And whenever I have clients coming to my practice with their dogs, I really try to see the love that they have for their dogs. I like to have compassion with, uh, with the failure of following the knowledge that they know and they haven't. I, I, I like to understand that, that um, they don't know what they don't know. But remember that you actually do have power over your dog's well-being. And when disease happens, I don't want you to blame yourself. As long as you're learning all you can and follow 
the suggestions. And at the same time, you know, there may be 20 different suggestions and you choose for option A and realize that option C may have been a better choice, but he didn't know that. So again, you have to be really kind and compassionate to yourself because um, life is about learning. I decided to take the examples of kidney disease today. Uh, your kidney disease, disease can be caused by many factors. Uh, feeding dry food, um, injury to the third lumbar vertebra is actually quite common predisposi predisposing factor. Uh, I'm not sure whether you knew that uh, the lumbar spine, uh, the third lumbar vertebra is related to the kidneys. And when it's injured, the energy flow, blood flow and nerve flow to the kidneys is actually decreased. And as a result, the kidneys will suffer. I've seen that often, you know, I, when I examine a patient, I run my hands along the spine and I know which organs I should be focusing on. Um, there's, there's kind of like a different, I'm sorry, I skipped uh, one, one of the slides. There's different energy density in that area, or there may be heat, or if you push your thumbs at that particular spot, your dog will go down or will twitch the skin. Those are all signs that, um, that something is going on. We know that genetic predisposition, I discussed that before, is uh, one of the factors. Lack of access to water, or water that is not filtered, or water that is filtered too much, because some people give their dogs distilled water. They would give uh, their dogs reverse osmosis water, which is demineralized. And um, you know, distilled water and demineralized water is not really ideal for our dogs. It stresses the kidneys because um, they have to work harder to regulate Electrolytes, the use of anti-inflammatory drugs. If you want to know about anti-inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs, and how they damage kidneys, uh, there is an article um, on my website, and I'm sure that Christina will post it for you. Um, I've seen many patients uh, in the course of my work and practice um, being completely healthy and then, for example, go for dental procedure or some sort of um, surgery and I would make a note to the specialist, no NSA, please. And these dogs are absolutely healthy. They have normal kidney tests before surgery. They go in the surgery, the specialist will ignore my request. Um, and I have a 13 year old dog with full blown kidney disease uh, a few, few weeks later. And, and obviously anesthesia may be one of the reasons and causes, but it's usually not because if anesthesia is done well, it actually very rarely causes any problems, especially when it doesn't happen too frequently. But with NSAIDs, uh, you have a description in the drug side effects of causing um, uh, them causing kidney disease. Obviously there can be toxins like ethylene glycol or mercury, uh, heavy metals, uh, raisins can cause kidney disease. Um, I'm not sure whether you know that raisins are toxic to dogs, so be careful. And nutritional deficiencies, you know, if the body doesn't have the um, building blocks to repair the organ and the cells, then obviously it may result in kidney disease. Also immune system dysfunction where uh, the body starts attacking its own tissue. Uh, the immune system can be sometimes overwhelmed. Um, a good example is when puppies go through um, getting about 20 different antigens or vaccines against 20 different diseases or not 20 different diseases, but they get about 20, they get three boosters times six, you know, it's 18 plus rabies plus kennel cough. And you have a real bad mix where the immune system has to deal with what it perceives pathogens and it's 20 pathogens, 20 infections within a period of two to three months super, super heavy on the immune system and the immune system starts kind of freaking out and overreacting and starts attacking its own tissue. That's how lupus, for example, happens or other autoimmune conditions. I'm not necessarily saying that um, uh, vaccines cause um, disease on their own, but they can be one of the factors, one of the boxes in the messy room to make it, make it really messy and cause, cause a disease. So, you know, there are, I say this a lot. There are 37,000 billion billion chemical reactions happening in the body every second. Now, this number is absolutely staggering. And, and you know, if I put this number in front of me on a little sticky and look at it every hour during the day, I don't stop being amazed. 
like there could be bad things happening in the world, but I look at this number and I go like, we are walking miracles. Our dogs are walking miracles. Everything in this nature and this on this planet is a, is a miracle. Like imagine anyone or anything doing 37,000 billion billion times a second. This is, this is like a out of, out of the body experience and it's happening in our body it's happening in your dog's body obviously this number is rough but uh, biochemists have estimated that this is the number of reactions um, happening in the body per second absolutely staggering you know in in natural environments imagine i love africa and i talk about africa a lot and um, in natural environments we take for granted that nutrients kind of flow from, from uh, the earth in the plants, in the herbivores, then onto the carnivores, and then all the nutrients eventually go back in the form of manure or the body decomposing. And so if you have all the nutrients in the soil and there is like a really nice close cycle, um, it's like an ecodome that is really amazing because you don't need to bring anything in and out our planet is like that, then the body can function properly. And the 37,000 billion billion, 37,021 zeros reactions per second can happen. But if we go to the modern world and, and in the last couple of months, it's changed obviously quite dramatically, but still nutrients and food travels at long distances. And these cycles are interrupted. You will never have the plant that is flown from, I don't know, let's say that Swiss chart is flown from Oregon to somewhere in Minnesota. Uh, you will not get the manure or the, the fecal matter back to, on the field in Oregon. You will not get the tomatoes from California that are shipped to somewhere in Canada back to the, the manure and, the, and, and whatever is built from the tomatoes back in the field. So there is a severe interruption of nutrient flow in our modern style and modern lifestyle and, and uh, how we produce food and how we transport food. So this is the biggest problem in nature now, but it's also the biggest problem in medicine and health. Because if you have deficient food of nutrients and minerals, the building blocks are not present and the reactions cannot happen. And if the reactions don't happen, disease happens. I want you to remember this because this is so simple and so easy to correct. And at the same time, most people do not understand it. I talk to my friends on the topic of nutrition from time to time they may consider me annoying because sometimes if I have a friend who is, um, let's say in her 50s or 70s, I get really upset when I see that they're complaining about their aches and pains and, and low energy level. And then I realize that they have not taken one sim simple essential nutrient. And, and, and they just think that everything comes in food and the food is transported and it's, it's, just not, it's just not what it used to be or what it is in Africa. If we wanna live like the Maasai in Africa and, and live the traditional lifestyle, I think that we probably would not need any supplements. We even would not need any probiotics because um, we would get exposed to the cattle and to the soil and, and uh, we would be much healthier. So, you know, when there's deficient food, I compare it, I used to compare it to uh, airplane seeds, but now um, it's hard to imagine even being on a plane. <laughs> and uh, that's why I decided to, decided to compare food deficiencies to parking lots. Every cell in the body has receptors for nutrients, whether it's protein or minerals or omega oils. So see, see it simply as parking spots. And if there's deficient food, the, the parking spots are empty. And what happens with the empty parking spots, other cars such as toxins can park in those spots. If you have the parking lot full, if you have the parking lot full, the toxins cannot park in the receptors in the parking spots. 
So this is how I see deficiency, and this is how I would like you to see deficiency in a simple form. Remember, empty parking lot or full parking lot. We want to have a full parking lot so no heavy metals or other toxins can park on the receptors in the cell because that can damage, that can affect uh, the 37,000 billion billion reactions. You know, some people ask me, so how do I find out whether I'm deficient or how do I find out whether my dog is deficient? Can I run a blood test? Um, and I'd say, well, blood test is a snapshot because blood flows in the body and it does not necessarily explain what the storage of these nutrients is, uh, whether we have somewhere, you know, it's almost like whether we have the pantry full or empty. When, you, when someone makes you dinner at home and they prepare a lavish dinner, you still don't know whether they have any food left for tomorrow or not, or whether they've given you everything that they, they could, right? So it's the same thing with, um, with um, blood testing. Blood testing will not tell you what the storage of minerals is. And also it will not tell you what the minerals level, mineral levels have been uh, over the past two months. It will only tell you the snapshot at the moment. It's almost like I'm taking a picture and I have a dog in the picture, but a few seconds later, I don't have a dog, dog in picture. And so if I say, if I say, you know, there's been a dog living on this property for two months, and I take only one picture, you'll say, well, you know, the dog may have just come by, right? But it's not there. It hasn't been living there. So the same thing with minerals and blood tests is just uh, you know, but good for organ function. It may be good for the basic um, um, parameters like glucose, or it can even give you an idea whether the sodium and potassium at that time was okay but it will not give you a timeline of whether your dog is, has good storage and good, let's say, mineral levels. And it will also not give you a timeline what the exposure to toxins is. So there is a, there is a better method. And I'm, uh, when I discovered uh, this uh, many years back, I was really thrilled and it made a lot of sense. You know, hair is beautiful. I don't have much of it, but, um, it can be beautiful, Alicia, right? I always admire Alicia, hair, Alicia's hair or anyone else's hair. Um, I used to have really light blonde hair and I sometimes miss it, but then I also say that it's practical. It's practical because you can determine what your dog's mineral and toxin levels are. Now you won't be able to determine every single toxin that is in the environment and made by man, but you will be able to get an idea whether your dog's food is clean or not based on testing mineral content in hair. And I will explain why the hair is, is serving as a time capsule. When the hair grows up or is growing up, um, it needs blood supply. And the blood supply carries all the different minerals and nutrients and the hair follicle can thrive. And then it also seals the minerals in as it grows out. So think about it this way. On May 21st, the hair grew a little bit and it sealed minerals from May, May 1st. And then on May 2nd, again, it, it grows a little bit and it seals minerals from May 2nd and May 14th and May 30th. And if you do it for about three to four months, you'll have an inch of hair that you can collect and you'll have a time capsule of mineral content in the hair. But now you may be asking, so how do I know what amounts of minerals are in my dog's hair or toxins like mercury or arsenic or lead? Well, it's actually really cool and simple. Well, simple, I'll try to make it simple. There are four different forms of matter in nature that we know. One of them is the solid, um, solid um, form like ice then there's water the liquid, then there is water vapor and steam, that's the, that's the gas. And then there's the fourth one, that's plasma. And plasma is when you heat the gas so, so, so much that it starts shooting the different particles. They basically can't hold together anymore because they're just so fast and vibrate so fast that they start shooting these particles in, in the case of water, hydrogen or oxygen. 
And we have a machine which is called um, plasma, plasma induction spectrometer. I'm sorry, I just had a little blank here. And uh, that can count actually the light that emit, that the particles emit. So you first heat the hair really, really high until it turns into plasma. And then you count the different elements or the, the, the intensity of the light that these elements or particles emit. And you can do quantitative, qualitative and quantitative um, assessment, meaning that you can see exactly how much mercury is in that hair. And you also have norms and know that, that there's a certain normal level of mercury and then there is something that is above. So you transform the hair into plasma and then you count the different minerals and it's super accurate method, but it's also quite inexpensive. You know, um, a hair test would cost somewhere, you know, little over a hundred dollars, which is, which is quite amazing because you can get a lot of information. So hair is a time capsule. And, and this morning when I was preparing um, this little chat, I went into, our results, we have thousands and thousands of results of hair key test. And uh, I just randomly selected different, uh, different tests. And uh, the first two were actually high in mercury. And you can see that right here. I'm not sure whether you see my mouse. Um, Alicia, can you see my mouse, my arrow? Uh, yes, it is showing up for me, Peter. Okay, mm -hmm. so so this is just to explain. This is these are the results of hair test or hair key test, and I had to make them anonymous because I didn't want to post. Obviously, for medical confidentiality, I couldn't can't post a name. But you can see that the test was taken uh, on October 29, 2019, or done, and uh, these are the nutritional, the healthy elements. You can see that uh, this dog has uh, relatively low calcium high magnesium, uh, almost basically zero boron. So something is happening there. Um, some of these reactions, chemical reactions in the body will not be happening because boron is missing. And we also have high mercury because this is normal, the white area and normal in the normal, in the nutritional elements is right here. But we have high mercury and we have also marginal arsenic and we have uh, marginally high lead and aluminum. So this dog is not a happy camper on the level of biochemistry because there are quite a few toxins. Um, but mercury is a, is a suspicious element here, very suspicious. It's very high. I would, I would like to actually go into the test and see whether this dog is on fish diet because usually that is the case. So you can see how much information you can get from uh, a simple hair test. You have also some other additional minerals. Um, there is another test, uh, the second test that I pulled. And again, mercury is high. This dog does have higher boron than normal, but it is low iron, can you see? And it is low cobalt, which is part of vitamin B12, cobalamin. And it may cause um, digestive issues. I would not be surprised if this dog had some sort of um, intestinal problems. Uh, so I can just look at these tests and I already know quite a bit about the dog or the patient without really knowing anything else. Um, I'm sure that Christina will post um, an article on mercury content in fish and what to do about it. This is the last and third test that uh, I would like to show you. And you can see that the mercury in this dog is actually normal. And um, you can see that boron is normal, but we have low calcium here. So you can actually see that it's really simple, but also beautiful. The reason why I kind of can't find words because it is really beautiful to see how much you can do with running a simple hair test and um, give your dog what it needs to have proper, healthy biochemistry and healthy biochemistry means healthy cells and healthy cells mean healthy organs and healthy organs mean healthy body and longer life and longer health span. Now, I would like you to keep it simple when it comes to disease prevention and medicine and even toxins.
and how to eliminate toxins in your dog's body. Remember that empty receptors are a problem. Empty spots for minerals are a problem. So the first thing that you need to do is to provide your dog with good food, but also the essentials. And uh, we do have some um, articles and also pages um, that will give you an idea what essentials I give to my dog or what essentials our customers take as well. I have packs, I'm seeing packs um, running outside here. I so would like to give him a hug, but I'm not sure. I don't wanna disturb this uh, lesson <laughs> or this uh, broadcast. Uh, Full receptors with good minerals. This is a nourished body, right? All the parking lot, parking spots are there, but or full. But there's also possibility, sorry, that the red cars are still the mercury, right? So we may actually try to also <laughs> give some of these cars parking tickets and ask them to move because it's not there. It's a reserve parking spot for good minerals, not for toxins and heavy metals. The 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 cases that you've seen with the high minerals. Um, with the high mercury are the red cars here. Some people, I, I had one, one time, I did a little bit of an interview, um, was asked for an interview with, um, with a broadcaster, with a podcast maker. And she said, Peter, I don't want you to use simple terms. My listeners will think that you think that they're stupid. They're intelligent people. You can speak in medical terms. And First, I didn't know what to say. And then I thought, you know, maybe I'm just stupid because I just so love to have simple ideas and simple images for me to remember how to keep my dog healthy and how to actually simplify medicine. Because yeah, I can start speaking in Latin and, and throw in um, Latin and complicated medical terms. And I'm sure that many of you will understand them but I do think that the medical lingo actually is one of the, it's like legalese. Um, it's one of the ways to distance ourselves from our patients and clients. And I don't think that it's the right way to practice medicine. Uh, you know, when I read a legal document, half of the time, I don't even know what it's, what it's talking about while I could use it and use a simple language in two sentences. And I think really it's one of the ways of the, legal profession and maybe even veterinary profession, medical profession, gaining distance and maybe creating this error of, um, of separation. I do not think that it's a, it's a good way to go. It's my personal opinion. So simple plan in eliminating toxins is to assess your dog's status and you, you can run hair tests um, uh, in your dog. It's very simple. Then you can park the essentials in the empty spots then you can also give some of the toxins, the parking tickets to ask them to move by doing detox, giving your dog clean food, organic food and reduce environmental toxins. You know, food, uh, I, I could, we could go forever. Um, there is a simple recipe maker. You can, you can start making your dogs uh, natural recipes whether they're cooked or not. I have uh, some people telling me, Peter, I can't give my dog whole food. I cannot feed my dog organic food. And I understand that sometimes, and especially now the budget is, uh, is just not there. But if you add the cost of kibble plus uh, medical expenses and also the emotional cost of losing your dog prematurely. And we have now shown uh, from our research and our, our surveys that dogs on homemade diet live about one and a half years longer. And that's an understatement, I think, because we didn't ask how long these dogs have been on raw food or cooked food. So it's probably much, much, much longer or much more. My experience is that, that a dog or breed that would live, let's say, 11 or 12 years on processed food quite often lives 15, 16, 17, and more. But you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you feed kibble that every single dog will live a short life. Uh, there are other factors playing a role. Remember, there are many, many factors. It's like the grandma that smoked and uh, lived until 90, right? Like there are some exceptions, but we know that processed food is not good for our dogs. It's not good for us. The only difference is that medical doctors do not say that, do not say that we should eat processed food and veterinarians still do. 
And I don't really need to give you an answer why that is. I'm sure that you've already figured that out. Um, reducing environmental toxins. Um, sometimes we don't even think what, well, we don't know what we don't know. I see people walking their dogs on golf courses at night. Um, they're full of toxins, full of um, herbicides. Um, that's not good. If you look at the components of cleaning products in your household, be careful. And sometimes you can even go online and look up the medical uh, safety data sheet for each product, MSDS, and you will see how many toxic chemicals are in the cleaning products. And your dog is lying on the floor. Um, many people are using chemicals in the garden. Um, those, this all matters. Um, so simple plan is simple. I'm not necessarily saying that if you follow these uh, five steps that you will prevent every disease in the world, but it's one of the ways of applying a simple health plan to your dog's life and hopefully making him or her live longer and healthier life. I know that uh, you're sitting here because you care about your dog. I know that you're sitting here because you love your dog. You want him or her to live as long as possible. And even though life is a terminal disease, uh, we can extend it and we can extend not only lifespan, but also health span. Health span. So that's, that's all for today. Um, as I said, tomorrow is Pax's first birthday. There's a lot to celebrate. He's been such a good dog. And I really, really, I can't even understand how I could score for the second time. I was just sitting sitting at my computer the other day writing and thinking, how is it possible that I get a perfect dog for the second time around? And then I realized that pretty much every dog that we get and we fall in love with is perfect. I know that you have a perfect dog at home and you had many perfect dogs if you haven't had just one. So give your dog a hug for me. And if you have any questions, I'm here now to answer, answer them. And I'll stop sharing. And see whether I can exit here. Alicia, are you there? I am here, yes. I've been keeping an eye and um, I encourage the community that are watching right now, if you'd like to post a question, please do so. This is the time for it. Uh, and we'll keep an eye on these, these questions coming in. Yeah, and if there's no questions, um, what else can I tell you? Um, uh, I, I know that, um, that it can be sometimes really, really, it can seem really complicated. Medicine seems to be complicated, health seems to be complicated, but we also sometimes like to blame others for what's going on. You know, in the, in the times of COVID-19 crisis, I see two kinds of people um, in my life. The first kind, um, is um, feeling low, sad and depressed, complaining about um, not having enough money or not being able to deal with the situation. And I understand it's, it's difficult. Like some people have lost their jobs that they had for 20, 30 years. And I, I don't really necessarily think that there is anything wrong to, go through difficult time. I mean, it's all wrong, but it, there's, you know, we all go through difficult times. But our response, it really depends on us. Um, I have a friend who's lost her job because she live, she works in entertainment and tourism. And basically she doesn't have a job. And I've given her some suggestions to take some courses and read some books because um, she's been planning to kind of restructure and redesign her life. So we agree that she's going to take one, one lesson every week and that I can keep an eye on her to make sure that she'll do it. It was the first two lessons and then it went back to the complaining about her not having enough money. And I think that it's super important and I'll be sending a newsletter this Saturday that has, um, has um, a few bits of information on this topic. I think it's important to try and do our best to find a solution. Because if there is no water, let's say in your well or your pipes break, like sitting there and complaining about the broken pipes is not gonna fix them. 
or if you're hiking and your dog doesn't have water, you have to find the water and you don't have water, you have to find the water. And there may be a good, good Samaritan who will actually give you a bottle of water, but then you'll walk on and you still will have to find the water. So it's much better to learn how to find water. It's much better to teach people how to fish than giving them fish. So this difficult time, and I, I know that uh, some of you are in, in difficult situations, is a good opportunity for us to try to find solutions. And I've been, I've been thinking about uh, this a lot because <laughs> many people uh, comment, or sometimes I get people comment on Facebook, I would like to have your life. And I say, yeah, you have to start it in a very polluted small town on a brink of a coal mine behind the Iron Curtain. And you know, I think that the best way to be in life is actually to be stubborn and and have and be relentless in repeating. Because I I was actually refused um, refused um, I I wasn't I was denied admission to vet school the first time around. Uh, my visa for immigrating to Canada was declined. Uh, I had to go through so many hurdles, and I I started to say that. No doesn't mean no, it just means yes, but later. So building your life sometimes may be difficult and sometimes emotional and physical health doesn't allow us to, doesn't allow us to um, go full on, but taking little steps, like the person who is learning to walk and be aware of our bad habits can sometimes really make a huge difference. And I'm thinking that maybe some of these webinars should be about how to built um, life and uh, I would love to do that I would love to actually give people an idea uh, what it takes it takes a lot of mistakes a lot of challenges but not taking a no for an answer when it really matters and when you know that there's a slight window of positive outcome we need to aim for that and try and try and try it's like a puzzle right um, if we really work on the puzzle or jigsaw puzzle we, we can put the pieces together but it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort so life is like that too so don't give up please i know that it's been difficult don't lay yourself but but you know don't watch too much netflix and too much youtube and try to take at least some time for your dog and some time for the learning audiobooks are amazing you know you can pretty much find an audiobook on anything so anyway, Alicia, do you have any questions? We do, yes. Uh, we have some questions from the community. So I will start with Sonia. Um, Sonia asks, what type of food can I give to feed my um, dog to gain weight? Uh, one of my dogs has a very high metabolism and can't keep the weight on. Okay. So assuming that you've done all the um, tests and examination with your veterinarian and everything is fine on that level, um, if your dog is thin, um, or you think that your dog is thin, uh, we have a little widget on our website in the recipe maker that will actually tell you that your dog is thin. If you can, if you're, if you can see his ribs, if he's either the short red or a short hair dog, or if you give a long hair dog bath and you can see the ribs, that would be too thin. Some dogs like active puppies or young dogs may actually be a little slimmer. Um, there are like the teenagers or young 20 year olds. We all wish we were like 20 year olds. <laughs> but um, basically if you see the ribs, that means that your dog may be thinner. But if otherwise he's healthy and happy and normal, acting normally, you can feed your dog as much as you want. And that's the only thing that I would do. If your dog is really skinny, uh, then you may want to, explore the possibility that his or her digestion and metabolism is too fast, but you can also up the, the digestive, digestive kind of capacity by giving digestive enzymes. You can just get uh, good quality digestive enzymes in your pharmacy or health store and add that. You can also add apple cider vinegar. If you feed uh, kibble, I would highly recommend feeding a uh, natural cooked or raw diet, and we have the recipe maker. I am sometimes blown away uh, about the difference between a kibble bowel movement and, and um, homemade raw or cooked diet bowel movement. 
you will see so much volume in the kibble bowel movement. And it is just because your dog cannot digest the food. It has so much um, fiber and roughage and, and indigestible ingredients that your dog actually is full, but he cannot digest it. By the way, high fiber diet is amazing for weight loss in people because we feel full, don't eat as much, and cannot digest the fiber. So it's perfect for us if we need to lose a few pounds. But if your dog is thin, make sure that you feed wholesome food. There can be fiber in the form of vegetables. Uh, and I do support vegetables because, you know, again, adding more nutrients. And I've seen dogs that are on meat, bones, and vegetables do better than just meat. I know that there are some raw foodists, maybe even watching today, who say, you know, I only feed meat and, and, and prey model is my, my way to go. I'm not necessarily saying that, that, that um, I have universal truth, but I've seen in my practice that these dogs and vegetables, bones and meat and organs do much better than just meat. Anyway, I hope I answered your question. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the next question we have is from Dora. Um, first up, she says, happy birthday to Pax. Um, so we'll start there. Thank you. Um, and she also asks, what sort of vitamins and supplements should I give to my three-year-old poodle? Uh, you know, uh, I, I always am a little hesitant and you probably may have noticed that today. I, when I have these Facebook lives, I am always hesitant to recommend products. I have many years back, I had a real challenge. When I got Sky in 2001, I was giving supplements and products um, made by other manufacturers. And, and I learned that not only some of the vitamins are synthetic and they're not ideal for our body and the biochemistry because they're made of crude oil and coal and, and they don't really necessarily represent true food. I also knew that uh, many of these supplements are made in China. So I, I was kind of in front of a decision whether I would make my old supplement line or not. And then I started to kind of uh, doing a lot of work in um, fermentation and fermented supplements and making them into whole food based supplements. And it's not whole food, but whole food based supplements. And so I ended up uh, creating my own supplement line and that's what I give to Pax. I see a huge difference between um, Sky and Pax, how they grew because Sky got put on the supplements when he was around eight or nine. And Pax was on, has been on them since um, eight weeks since I got him. And the difference is unbelievable. So I, I do have um, uh, essential product line. Um, for those of you who want to explore it, you can go on the website and uh, check the reviews and testimonials because instead of me blowing my own horn, I, I am actually really grateful for all the testimonials that come, come our way. And um, all I can say is that I'm always really touched and blown away how high the reviews are. We don't have one single product that would be four stars. We have everything four and a half and up and, um, and I'm very grateful. And it kind of tells me that, that if you do something with love and passion that eventually it just kind of, you know, it just kind of clicks in. And maybe I have a little bit of a talent for formulation. I'm sure that there are other products. I, you know, I don't comment on other people's products. Um, even if I have an opinion, I just have a, a very simple approach of not commenting on other people's products. So all you can do is to, to do research on your own. Also, I invite you to check our uh, Fabulous Four, which we call the Fabulous Four Essentials, which is omega oils, probiotics, uh, minerals, and vitamins in simple forms. But they're not as simple. They're a little more than that. Anyway, um, thank you for the question. Great, and um, Stephanie has an excellent question. Um, she says, hi, Dr. Tobias and team. I'd love to ask about fleas, ticks, and heartworm, et cetera. So many people load their dogs with toxins to prevent these things. Um, I would love to chat about preventatives, natural alternatives, um, and what to do if there's an infestation um, to avoid this. Um, you know, if you live in the United States, Stephanie, we have a solution for you. Um, again, when I, when I have a problem in my own life and or my friends have problems, we try to solve them. And we have come up with uh, an all natural flea and tick prevention. 
Um, even if your dog is invested, it actually has uh, very high efficacy and uh, it has uh, money, money uh, bag guarantee. Uh, we unfortunately have been faced in some countries with uh, the very strict regulations of natural products. Uh, in Canada, for example, we would have to have $200,000 just for the testing of the product without any guarantees that it would go through. So we cannot carry this product in Canada. I do feel that this is a result of lobbying groups from pharma industry to kind of lobby the government to protect the customers from natural products. But we know how it actually is that every single flea product on the market that is chemical actually has killed some dogs and cats. And he, all you can do is to actually go on the safety uh, reports from, let's say, um, I think it's the USDA and you will see what's, what really is going on. Uh, nevertheless, there is a little bit of noise in the background. I'm sorry. I'll have to. <laughs> Max is welcoming someone here. Um, anyway, uh, so in the US, we have, uh, we have products called Flea Hex and Tig Hex, and you can order them. And in Canada, unfortunately, right now, we don't have any avenue to send these products. Uh, you could import them through a friend, uh, let's say, from the US. I know that for personal use, if you buy them in the US, you can actually uh, have them shipped to the US to the border crossing, and then you basically import them yourself. So that, that can be done for your personal use. It's complicated. I, I get really frustrated. I, I sometimes have to choose the battle uh, to fight. And you know, at this point, I feel that uh, there's so much more other work to do than, than um, fighting the lobby and politicians who are bought. <laughs> Sorry, I got a little tangent here. It's, it's a big thing for me to kind of see what's going on in medicine and how it operates and functions. Anyway. Great. And Alicia, um, what thanks, else do you have? Yeah, thanks for addressing that. Um, and further to what you said, we've certainly had many dog lovers from Canada use exactly the method that you've described. Um, and not once over the last couple of years have I ever heard of anyone having an issue. So it's a great way around it for now. Um, we have another question here. This is from Tracy. Um, she wonders if you could address um, apple cider vinegar. Um, if you think that's a good addition to the diet and what your thoughts are on digestive enzymes, be it for underweight dogs or dogs in general. Okay, um, great question. And it's gonna be last question for today because it's um, two minutes to a uh, full hour. Um, apple cider vinegar, I like apple cider vinegar when I see that dogs do not digest well, they uh, throw up. Um, are thin. It does uh, boost um, the digestion, and I think that it also helps. Uh, you know, it helps with the acidity of the stomach that 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 uh, is ne necessary for proper digestion. Um, I sometimes use it in dogs that have pancreatic um, insufficiency. I'm sorry, Ed, we have a, a a little bit of an internet connection. Alicia, are you there? Oh, I can Alicia. Um, I can hear you. Hi, everyone. Um, I think that there was a little technical glitch, maybe uh, some internet trouble over in Maui, but we'll see if Dr. Tobias can get back online uh, and carry on. Oh, I think that. I hear you and oh, see you again. Still live. All right. Okay. Uh, we have interrupted. Apple cider vinegar. Do not know what you've heard. Anybody you haven't hear, heard? So I, I'll just um, I'll just repeat. Um, apple vinegar is good for digestive in, insufficiency. I think that we are having internet uh, internet connection issues. We will stop unfortunately now because um, I, I will. Can you hear me, Alicia? Yeah, it was a little bit um, touch and go for a moment, but right now I can hear and see you. Um, so it's clear right now. Let's try one more time. Outside of vinegar is good for digestive insufficiencies for dogs that are either thin or have some sort of inability to digest food. It also does seem to improve the, the overall microbiome of the, of the, the intestinal tract. 
in humans, it's been proven to improve digestion. Also, it's known to be good for uh, weight loss in humans. Uh, do not have not seen that in dogs. And uh, I would say that um, you can add apple cider vinegar safely um, to any dog's food, but I usually add it only to the dogs that have uh, digestive issues. And when it comes to digestive enzymes, you know, I would say middle age to older dogs, they would probably benefit from it. And also the same with people. I currently take digestive enzymes every day. Um, I, <laughs> I actually started being interested when one of our team members, Leah, um, Leah uh, had a grandma who was 103 or four when she passed away. And um, her recipe was Bailey's and digestive enzymes. <laughs> so I started doing a little bit of research. Anyway, going back to digestive enzymes in dogs, um, middle-aged and senior dogs would benefit from them. I used to be of that opinion that uh, we don't want to supplement uh, something that we want the dog's body to produce. But we also now know that uh, by the middle-aged, um, middle age, the cellular metabolism decreases. No matter what we do, it does decrease. And we don't have the full capacity of producing producing hormones and digestive enzymes as we used to when we were young. So I think that supplementing um, digestive enzymes is actually beneficial. And I think that that's today, that's all for today. Uh, we have had a few interruptions towards the end. So my apology, we will be back next week on Thursday at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. And thank you, Alicia, for helping. And thanks for Christina's help um, behind the scenes. Take You're care welcome. and we'll talk Take soon. Care. <laughs> Bye-bye.